Today's interview is with Dennis Bullock, who not only had a near-death experience, but also had a visitation from his mother shortly after she died, where she shared premonitions about things that were to come in his life that actually came true. Now, if you've seen Dennis interviewed before, this is going to dive much, much deeper than he's ever gone into his near-death experience. And he is going to share some downloads of what I'm going to call secrets of the universe that he learned during his near-death experience. You are not going to want to miss this interview. Are you ready? Hey, we are here today with Dennis Bullock, who has an amazing story, actually two amazing stories. The first one that happened to him shortly after his mom's death when he was 29 years old. And the second one was a near-death experience he had at the age of 34. Now, Dennis, my audience loves to hear about signs and synchronicities. And I think that it's really interesting when somebody's had a near-death experience because their lens and the way that they look at the world changes and allows them to be much more open to signs and synchronicity. So we're really excited to have you on today to share your story and how signs and synchronicity still pervade your life even all of these years later. Well, thank you, Lori, for having me on your show. And uh, I really appreciate it, having the chance to, to tell my, my experiences and uh, talk about some synchronicities um, well, the first experience happened when I was 29 and um, me and my mother were very close and she was really like the, the light of my life at that time and um, she had bought me my first saxophone. I'm a, I'm a singer and saxophone player and um, when she died, uh, my whole world crashed. Um, I was... Uh, devastated uh, because we were very, very, very close. And um, I couldn't imagine a world without her. She was the love of my life. She, she, she bought me my first instrument and she didn't even have a job. She saved her money for years. So this was something when life threw that she, she, she died, got sick and died. That was it for me also. Um, and so uh, when she first died, passed away, I, I was, uh, every night I would go have a drink at the bar and then come home to my apartment in Canada, in Montreal, Canada, and just cry myself to sleep, sit on the side of the bed and cry myself to sleep. And this happened for about almost two weeks. And then one night I was doing my routine, coming back from, from the bar and going to sit on my bed. I, I would come in my room and I would just turn out the light and just go sit on the bed and cry myself to sleep. But this time I turned off the light and I, I went to untie my, my sneaker and I saw that there was light still on my sneaker. And I said, that was funny that it can't be because I, I know I turned out the light. And when I looked up, that's the crazy part is that it was like the sun was in my room. The sun that you see in the sky was in my room. And this sun was, bright, so bright and full of love. It's like a wave of love just covered me. Um, a love that I can't, uh, it's hard for me to even describe, it, but it's like how a mother holds a child, but a times a thousand. Um, it just washed over me and out of this sun came two other lights, which, which were smaller. One was a little, was big and one was a little bit smaller. And I recognized in these lights that one was my mother. <laughs> and, um, and the first thing I said was, wow, it's like that over there, mom. Oh my gosh. And um, because the love was incredible. And she began to, to talk with me, but kind of like a, a telepathy, but I could hear her like I hear you talking to me. But it, it was kind of like, shooting into my head sort of <clears throat> but the conversation was very easy very clear and um she said to me that um she's going to tell me one week in the future and she said um that 
uh, I'm gonna, I was in a band at that time and she told me that I'm going to have a gig, a job coming up uh, the next week. And she said, she's only allowed to tell me one week in the future. Mm-hmm. And, she, and she said, yeah. And she said, um, you're gonna have a job and there's gonna be a bouncer or a doorman at this job. And she said, um, he's going to be a, a, a homosexual, some kind of homosexual, and he's going to be a, a psychopath. She said, um, don't, whatever you do, don't get into a, a physical fight or an argument with this person. Um, because my mother knew me and I was 29 and I was very, <laughs> very vigor and, and ready to defend my manhood. I, 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 if, if, if a, if someone who was uh, a homosexual was to make a pass at me. Now, I I mean, I don't have nothing against people who are homosexual or lesbian or nothing like that. I don't have that. But if somebody knows that I'm not and they try to make a pass at me, that's for me kind of like a disrespect. And uh, so my mother knew me and she knew I wouldn't tolerate that. I would be ready to, to defend myself. So she told me, just tell him that you're not like that and just walk away from him. But don't get into a fight with him because he is a psychopath. He's not thinking like regular. She, she told me that. And she also told me about my girlfriend at the time. She said that um, I had been going out with her for about two years. And she said that she has three kids that I don't know about. And she said that she's going to try to have a fourth one with me but like more against my will, like she would say she's on the pill and she's not or stuff like that. And she said, just be beware of that. And then she told me um, she loves me. But then I said to her, I said, oh, well, um, mom, who is this other light? Because there was another light standing with her. Um, and it didn't say anything until I asked about it. And when I asked about it, it spoke to me. <laughs> And it's and and I said, who are you? And he said, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I asked my mom. I said, who is this other light? And the other light spoke to me and said, um, I'm an escort. And it said, it's I escorted your mother here, so so she could deliver a message to you. And then I and then I thought to myself, well, if I have God in my room, I'm going to ask all the questions I could ask. Like, why am I here? Who's going to be my kids? I mean, who's going to be my wife? Uh, um, you know, all the questions we have about life, I want to know. And the angel, which I consider like an angel, because there's so much love coming from it, it just said, uh, I'm going to answer in a very calm voice. I'm going to answer all your questions, but you won't be allowed to remember. Hmm. So it did tell me, <laughs> it's, it told me the answers, but I was only allowed to remember what my mother told me for the week. <laughs> so um, then my mother said she loves me and she said she's always gonna be around me, but she said, I won't be as aware that she's around me like I am this night. Okay. And then she, she her and this other light just floated back into the sun which was god there was just there and floated away and everything started to melt like the the all this love started to melt away like a ice cube in a in a glass and it just melted away and they just kind of uh faded away out of my room and then tears just burst out of my eyes because i said nobody's ever gonna believe me nobody's ever gonna believe this is happening nobody but I have the proof <laughs> because everything my mother told me happened. The very next day, I got a phone call from my band. We hadn't worked in about two or three weeks. And he said, we got a job. I said, oh, really? And I didn't say nothing to my band about what I experienced because I didn't want them to think, oh, you know, he's a great singer, great saxophone player, but <laughs> he lost his mind when his mother died. <laughs> So I said, I'm not going to tell them about this for sure. So I said, oh, okay, we have a job. Hmm. And uh, so I went to, we went to the sound check the next day and um, there was just two huge guys at the door of this club. And uh, I was looking at the whole situation saying, man, everything is beginning to happen like my mother said. 
you know, it was, it was, it was kind of spooky. So I went in there to, the bouncers didn't do nothing to me or say anything to me at that time. And we did our sound check and then we finished the sound check, by the way, for the audience is when a band checks the sound before the concert to make sure that everything is working perfectly. That's all. Right. Yeah. And um, so we went back to the club that night and I went in and we, we did our first set and that went great. And then after the first set, um, I was talking with the band and I, they were facing me and I was facing them. Um, and this one of the bouncers walked behind me and kind of grabbed my ass, my butt, excuse me, from the... <laughs> Uh, from behind and I was and I turned around and said hey guys did you see that this guy just grabbed my butt you know I gotta I gotta tell this guy something what's wrong with him and he went over in the corner and went like that and and I don't know what he was trying to do if he was trying to test me to see if I was gay I don't know but so I went over there I, I was a little bit angry and then I remembered what my mother said. She said, mm -mm, don't, don't, don't get into an argument with him. So I calmed myself down and I said, look, man, I'm not gay. And I don't want, don't, don't try to touch me. And he said, you had too many beers. I didn't try to touch you. And I said, yes, you did. And I said, I'm asking you nicely, please don't touch me. I'm not that way. So don't touch me. Thank you. And I walked away from him because I knew if I'd stayed, it was, the conversation was starting to go in the bad direction. Mm -hmm. So so I walked away and we finished our second set. And then um, I left the club and, and nothing happened. And then the next day I got a phone call from the band and they said, did you hear what happened? And I said, no, what happened? And, and he said, that guy that you, you said, you told us that, that tried to touch you and all that, um he broke both of the ribs of the club owner crushed them and now he's in jail for manslaughter i said what he said yes i said you're kidding he said i, I couldn't believe it and 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 he was in jail and then we hung up the phone and then i said oh my god then if she's right about that then that means she's right about my girlfriend too and i said oh i'm gonna call her so I picked up the phone and I called her and she was like, hello. I said, um, how you doing? I said, I, I got a question for you. I said, just tell me the truth, please. Do you have three kids? And the phone went silent. And then she said, who told you? And I said, I said, no, no, it can't be true. It can't be. I said, do you, do you have three kids? And she said, I told you, yes but who told you? And then I said to myself, I got to tell her. And then I said, you're not going to believe me, but my dead mother told me. And then I ended it with her because I said, if you're going to deny your own kids, I, I said, I don't want to be a part of, of you because I said, you know, this is, I know you for two years. And I said, I might even have dealt with your kids. It would have been okay if you had been honest, but right. you didn't, you didn't, you hid your kids and I said who knows what else you might hide from me so I said so we ended it and that was the first um experience wow. and that that changed me that gave me um a relief that my mom was okay yeah. uh and it also you know and and also gave me it told me that there was more to this life than just living <laughs> yes so yeah. how did your, so after you had that first sign and your mom came to you, like that's a bigger sign than most people will probably ever get a real visitation yeah. with an angel, yeah. but how did your connection with your mom change after that first experience? Well, I just knew that she was, there was times I knew that she was around me or just watching over me. And I also, I was no longer worried about where she was or or was she all right I was not even concerned about that um the only thing was was that you know like I said I didn't get a chance to really talk with people about it so it was like I was walking around with this big secret that <laughs> I couldn't tell anybody because I was like they're gonna they're gonna think I'm nuts if I start to tell the story that really happened 
so I kept it very very low key and I I think maybe I don't know maybe one person heard about it maybe and even them they looked at me like okay <laughs> okay <laughs> you yeah, know I think that is kind of a hard thing that's a hard because yeah. they're so real for you and when you tell it because the other person isn't experiencing it the way that you did it does probably fail to convert emotionally the same way that it did for you exactly but we both know that there's so much more to this world than what meets the eye. So after that, how did things change for you in your life other than knowing for sure that your mother was okay? Well, I mean, after that, I, I kind of tried to push it under a rug, which was quite hard to do. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did try and um, I was working with the, uh, a guy from the platters and um he was a great super great singer i mean he had record deals in germany here everywhere and um he was older than me and i was trying to be like him because uh, he was successful and i mean he had records he, he was doing all the shows and then he introduced me to drugs and uh i started to do drugs uh with him and um, because I thought that that was the way to go, you want to be successful, you know, you got to do some drugs, you got to, you know, get in there. And <laughs> uh, I thought that was the way. And um, the few years, maybe a year, two years had passed, and then he dropped dead. Wow. Um, I did his last show of his life. Mm -hmm. um, and when he died, that was kind of like a wake up call for me. And I said, hey, if you continue like him, you're going to be just like him. You're going to die. I said, you're going to die if you continue with all this stuff. So I, I stopped drugs cold turkey. But I said, uh, I said, well, um, I'm going to replace that with marijuana. So okay. so I said, uh, I'll smoke a joint every now and then uh, and should be OK. I was OK. So um so i was smoking my little joint every now and then and um, i was okay and then one weekend me and my new girlfriend we ran out of marijuana to smoke so i called a friend of mine and i said hey you got any 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 stuff any marijuana and he said yeah um i could bake it in a cake for you and 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 bring it to you and i said oh that would be cool i never had it in a cake so, um, and I told my girlfriend, he said, yeah, I never had any cake either. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so he baked it. He put a lot, 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 lot of marijuana in this cake. Oh my God. But you didn't know that. I didn't know that. But uh, after I, I found out, <laughs> which was too late, by the way. Um, so he brought the cake over uh, to the apartment um, and then he left. So I cut a small piece for me and a small piece for her. And we ate the cake and nothing happened. 20 minutes by nothing, nothing happened. And we said, wow, nothing happened. How about you? You feel anything? Nothing. So I said, maybe we got to eat more cake. I think so. <laughs> so I'm going to eat half the cake and you eat the other half. And then we should be okay. It was a chocolate cake, by the way. <laughs> so... <laughs> So she ate half and I ate half and, and uh, it was good. And then I said, do you still feel nothing? And she said, no, I don't feel anything either. Not yet. And, uh, me neither. I said, maybe we got a bad batch or something. I don't know. And then 10 minutes went by and then we started to feel something. But it wasn't necessarily getting high. It was more like our body starts to shut, shut down, start to shut off. I was starting to forget to breathe. I was having trouble to move. I wasn't able to move my body. I was starting having trouble to move my body. And she told me, she said, well, I think you better call 911 because um, while you still can. And I said, I think you're right. So I, uh, I strained myself to go to the phone and I called 911 and they said, what's the problem? And I was <laughs> embarrassed <laughs> to tell them, well, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, we took too much marijuana and a cake and can you come save us? <laughs> I think we're dying. <laughs> uh, so, 
Um, so she said, okay, we're going to send somebody over. And um, in Canada, if you, if you call um, an emergency ambulance um, about any kind of drug, they're going to call the police right away also. So the ambulance came, but the police came also. And the police came in expecting to charge us with something. But there was nothing left because we had ate all the cake. So there was no <laughs> evidence. So the Good police, news, bad news. <laughs> so the police left and the ambulance took us away. And this was at four o'clock in the morning, by the way. We were on the third floor and my neighbors were just looking out the window as we were coming down our rolling stairs. They were looking out the window and it just looked like a scene from Mick Jagger and, and David Bowie that they, they, they overdosed on something. It just looked like that. We were carried down in stretchers. The lights were flashing and the, the neighbors were looking out the window. I wonder what happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> it just looked like a real circus. And um, so I was a little bit relieved because by the time the ambulance came, I was really holding on to dear life because I could barely breathe. I could barely move. And my heart was trying to beat. So... When they came, a part of me was like, oh, thank God help has come. Uh, oh. uh, maybe I'll be all right, you know. So they took us down and, and as I was coming into the hospital, now this was a shock. I was being wheeled in on the stretcher at the reception, looking through papers was my dead mother. <laughs> she had her she had this certain outfit she used to wear where when she would go out with um, her friends, she had a, like a club of women, like 10 women, and they would all go bingo and they would go bowling and they would go. And she had this outfit on and she was looking through these papers for me. And I just rolled by her. They just rolled me right by her. And, um, and I said, that's odd. I just saw my mother looking for me. That's, that's weird. I never put two and two together. You're, <laughs> you're that close to death. That's why you're seeing her. So, right. so they rolled me into one room and they, and they put my girlfriend in another room and I had a room to myself. Uh, they gave me this black drink to drink. Um, later I found that it was called charcoal and, um, and I drank it. They said, drink it. And it's going to detox the body of all, all kind of anything toxic. So I drank it. it tastes horrible, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I drank it down. And they left the room, left me in the room for about two hours or something. And I, and I, I sat back on my bed and I thought, okay, finally, I'm going to be all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live. I'm going to be all right. And just as I started to relax, all of a sudden I heard my heart and it started to beat slow. Boop, boom, boop, boom, boop, boom, boop, boom, boom. And it stopped and I popped out. I popped out of my body. And the first thing I said then was I'm out. And I was on the side of my bed. My body was in the bed. And I looked at my hand. I was looking at my hand and my hand looked like um, if you watch TV and you watch very long time, a very long time to late at night, it's going to run out of programs and it's just going to be static. And the static, there's colors in this static. If you really look into the static, it's not just gray. And that's how my hand looked. It had like a gray bluish tint to it. Never forget that. And I looked at my hand, I was turning and looking at my hand. And then I heard the drop a drop of water there was a sink in my hospital room and I heard this drop of water and it just was boop boop and for some odd reason to a soul that was the most fascinating thing you could ever see <laughs> and I was fascinated by this drop of water and I said wow a drop of water oh wow so I was looking at this drop of water and the minute that I wanted to see the drop of water my vision went really fast up close, very fast, and then back again. And then, for some odd reason, I said, it was as if I was remembering how to ride a bike. Like, if, if you don't ride a bike in 20 years, and I say, and I 
and I put a bike in, in front of you, you're gonna know how to ride it still even. It was like that. I said, I think I can stop time. I can stop this water in midair. Oh yeah, I remember. And I just put my hand across the air and the drop of water froze in midair. I stopped time. And then after that, I saw it, it's just in midair. And then I said, I want to see that drop of water in all, in all possibilities, uh, every possibility. And then I just opened my hand like that, just like that. And five of me appeared, one on the right, one on the left, one underneath the water, one on front of the water, and one looking at all those looking at the water. And then it was me near the hospital bed standing, looking at all five of them. And then uh, I was like, wow, wow, I was just amazed. I said, oh, and then I, when I would close my hand, it would all suck back to one, one, one me. So then I started to do that. <laughs> it started to be like Bugs Bunny. I, I, this was fun. I, I started to have fun. Boom, boom. And then I said, this time I'm going to open my hand with a little shake. And I went, boom. And they would appear with a little shake like that. And it was five of me. And I kept doing that, poof, poof, you know, having fun. And then I burst out laughing because it was just too comical. I couldn't believe it. It's just too comical. And when I started, when I burst out laughing, that was amazing because it was like I was laughing in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> and I was having a ball. I had totally, I wasn't even concerned about my body it was like a, did you ever look back at it well that was the thing I, i'm glad you mentioned that but that was the thing that i didn't want to do because i was afraid that i was going to see my face in some distorted scary thing so i didn't look back at the, at the body i think i might have saw my leg or my foot but that was it. I didn't look at the were face. Were you in your body at this point? Or do you think you were no, out no, of your body? No, well, I was out of my body. From the point I looked at my hand, that's all out of the body. The body was over there. And I was in front of the water. In fact, I even had moved. I, I was more in front of the sink, in front of the water. And um, so as I was having all this fun, just dividing myself in five and back and forth and back and forth and I laughed and burst out laughing. Then I heard a voice from behind me and it was very gentle, but it wasn't my thought. That's why I knew it was someone else because it's, it's, it's so gently said like a parent with a child in a playground, if you stay out here too long, you might have to stay. It's like, like a parent would say, don't run around the corner so fast, you could fall. It was just like that. Very, not, not an order, but like a concerned parent. And then I said, that's right. Oh, yeah. My body, yeah, I can't stay out too long. My, my heart is stopped. I can't. Yeah, you're right. And then I didn't even think so much about who said that. <laughs> but I knew somebody. And I, I kind of assumed that it was God. So then I pointed myself in the direction of my bed, because like I said, I didn't want to see that face. <laughs> so I pointed my soul in that direction and I just flew into it. I just, my, with my mind, I just said, going back into the body, go back into the body. And I flew into the body and my heart started to beat, boom, boom, like that. It, it had like a double beat at first and then it, it started to beat and then I was okay. And at that point, I was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> I can't believe what just happened. How did you know that it wasn't a dream? Well, the thing was, it, it was, because first thing, I, it happened too fast. I mean, I just drunk the tar. They didn't give me kind of any kind of sedative or nothing to, to, to go to sleep. I just drunk the tar and the tar, it was just tar. That's all. It was not a sleeping pill. So when it happened, um, it happened right away. So I know that I was not asleep. I didn't fall asleep and then it gradually happened. No, 
As soon as I drank that, I laid back on my bed, and then it, it happened. I heard my heart right away, boom, 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 slowly, and then it stopped. Then I popped out. And when I popped out, that was, I can tell you this. On the other side, it's more real than here. Yes. It's more yeah. real. Yes. Yes. So that, I mean, it, this is, uh, and here's another thing. If I dream something, I can't even remember it the next day. This I remembered for years and years and years and years, every detail, every detail. It's never faded from my memory, never. That's amazing. If you, I had two dreams last week. I can't even remember what they were hardly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah you know that that's for me that's the proof that i know that it happened that it was real <laughs> because the memory is burned in my thing just like my mother's situation did you ever see your mom again while you were in the hospital you saw her as you were coming in did you ever see her again no because oh yeah i want to tell you that um when i was out of my body also i got downloads information Okay. Like incredible information that I didn't really ask for. It's like when I was out of my body, the more longer I stayed, I was swelling with information and power. First, I discovered I can, I can stop time. Next, I discovered I can divide myself. And it was just going on and on and on and more and more and more until that voice came. But by then, I had information about uh, why do souls come here? I had information about Christ. There's many. I had information. There's a Christ consciousness also. Uh, I had information about, uh, but that doesn't mean there's only Christians and, and, and that that's the only religion. No. Uh, there, there's information. It was just information and information. There's no right or wrong on the other side. Um, there's, um, we come here for experience, not to learn. We know already. Um, souls are perfect already. Also, we're, we are like gods. We're like God. We're, there's not, not in a small G, but a big G. I mean, we can create a universe with a thought. Uh, we can have several lifetimes spontaneously at the same time. Mm. So, so much information came to me uh, this time. So when I came back this time, it was a lot different <laughs> because this time I really knew uh, that I knew a lot. And this time I, it was just, well, how do I share all this? <laughs> you know, um, my whole, my whole perception changed. We all are one. Um, also, um, everything that you do has a, an effect on everybody and everything. And you just don't see the effect, but it does affect. Even when you think, oh, it's not helping. It is helping. You just don't see it with your human eyes and your third dimension vision, but it is helping tremendously, much more than you know. So, so that's what's, the biggest, what's the biggest example you can give us about what we can do that in your mind helps, whether we know it or not? Prayer, that's number one. Prayer is not just some religious thing or some goodwill, oh, say a prayer, no. <laughs> prayer is powerful it, it does physical things it changes physical things there's science studies that if you pray for a, pa a patient who's prayed for and a patient who is not prayed for the patient who is prayed for gets well faster that's a scientific fact um also there's um also what you say your words have power so be careful what you say to people and what you say to things and sometimes um, we don't all, we won't always understand if somebody's mean or cruel, um, but still to try your best to get to not get into their vibration, uh, their frequency, and still wish them well, wishing wishing your enemies well, which is not always easy, believe me, <laughs> mm -hmm. but wishing your enemies well and letting them go because the whole thing is it's not about. It's not about right or wrong. They're just on the long way home and the people in the higher vibration are on the shorter way home. That's it. That's it. That's, that's the, what I got from the download. So um, it's not that you have to go and be a doormat to someone. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying um, 
somebody's rude to you doesn't mean that being rude back to them is going to it makes it correct it's just that you don't know their story and they're 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 a little bit lost <laughs> okay that's it you say something kind and then you you leave you don't have to put yourself in a, a lower vibration but always put out um positive you know before i was not like that before i was like oh really you're going to say that to me well let me tell you <laughs> well that that's changed now now i just say if somebody's rude to me i just say oh poor i think to myself poor you you're you're a little bit lost um i wish you good and i and i quietly in my mind send them love and wish them good and i just go on my business but before i was not like that because i know everything affects everything everything affects everything and that person that hate that we hate the most or that we think oh they're nasty or they're horrible they're, guess what they're a part of you <laughs> we're all that's like your brother or your sister they're part of you the one you hate the one you can't stand that's a part of you <laughs> so I, I learned i learned that and accepted that and um so it's changed to be that way and the universe is always sending you signs and and people in your life uh for reasons yes and i think that this is a perfect segue to talk about how we met <laughs> oh yeah well exactly so you know after the second near death experience um i didn't know what to do and um it just so happened 34 so this is a long this is a long time ago that this yeah, happened yeah 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 this this the second death experience so i held this the story in for years and I started to help people a little bit like okay. uh, I would do a little reading if somebody was like in a desperate situation or they're going to suicide or well, tell, something how, like that well, explain how you were able to uncover other people's situations because I think oh, this is a really okay. special story okay so so all right so about a year after my second near-death experience I got with the band and we were playing in up north in Mont Roland in a place in Canada. And it was a snowstorm. There was hardly nobody in the club. And uh, we were bored. You know, I was sitting at the table uh, in the club and, and we were drinking beers. And it was only us and the waitress, waitresses and one customer. So I was bored. So I, I called this waitress who I didn't know from a hole in the wall. I said, hey, come here, come here. And she came running over thinking I was going to order a drink. But I said, I'm going to tell you your future for fun. So I took her left hand and I grabbed her, in her left hand and I said, uh, your boyfriend's paraplegic. Um, he blamed you for him being paraplegic. Um, and three months from now, you're going to meet a guy. You're going to fall in love and you're going to marry him and you're going to leave this paraplegic guy. And then I left her hand. She didn't say nothing the whole time I was talking. And I didn't pay it no mind because I had a few beers, so I didn't pay it no mind. And I left her hand and I finished my beer and we start talking and, uh, you know, and she left. A year later, I came to the same club. We played the same club and she ran up to me and she said, hey, did you know that everything you said to me was true, came true, was true? I said, what? She said, did you know, I said, everything, your, your boyfriend was paraplegic? She said, yes. I said, he blamed you for your, for his handicap? She said, yes. You met a guy three months after? She said, yes. And I said, you got married to him? And she showed me the wedding ring. When she showed me the wedding ring, the hairs on my arm went up to my neck. And I said, oh my God, I'm an alien. I said, <laughs> I, I have no idea <laughs> who I am, what I am. Oh my God. And 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 my band members were looking at me and I was like, you know, they started looking at me like Nostradamus. I was like, I, I didn't know what to do. So that was that was the first time that I realized that from that second NDE, I got some kind of gift or something. Something ain't is different. Something. And then I, I had another situation that I learned the hard way. Another uh, guy who was a friend of mine who was a doorman and he loved the band and stuff. He was cool, cool people, uh, huge, huge guy. And I had a premonition about him that I had it on Thursday that he shouldn't go out this weekend. Hmm. And uh, he worked for like what we call after hour places, clubs that stay open after the normal clubs. 
that's like from three to seven in the morning or something like that. And um, that's where musicians and artists and people would go um, if they still wanted to have a beer or someplace quiet and talk and, and you still could have a beer and we call it after hours. So he was the doorman from one of those places. So I had this premonition on Thursday. After my job on Friday, I went to one of his after hours where he worked and I saw him, I said, hey man, how's it going? All right, everything's cool. And I didn't say nothing to him because I said, nah, you're going to think I'm crazy if I tell a big guy like that, hey, man, you better go home. Don't, don't stay out this weekend. You know, something really terrible going to happen to you. So I said, nah, I'm not going to tell him that. It, maybe it's just a feeling with me. Because like I said, this gift was new. I said, maybe it's just a feeling. You know, it's, you know maybe you had a bad nightmare. You know, don't, don't, don't do that. So I didn't tell him. And then, then that Sunday, I went back to the after hours. He wasn't there. It was another doorman at the, at the place. And this doorman, when I went in, was crying. He had tears rolling down his face. And I said, hey, man, uh, what's wrong? He said, you didn't hear? I said, no. About what? Nunny, uh, he, he's dead. You know, the, the guy's dead. I said, no, can't be. He says, yeah. And I said, what happened? He said that he took a girl home and not home uh, to a hotel. And she waited till he fell asleep and she cut his throat. She slashed his throat. She was a psychopath and, and they caught her, but she, he bled to death. He couldn't, he couldn't uh, defend himself because he had lost too much blood on his neck because he, he was attacked while he was sleeping. And, uh, and then I said to myself, never, never, never again, if I have information for someone, I'm going to withhold it. Never. I said, if the president of the United States has a problem, if I have a premonition, I'm going to call him and tell him, hey, don't do this, blah, blah, blah. That's it. And then they can do whatever they want after. But I'm never going to hold the information. And from that point on, um, I became more comfortable with my gift. And I was able to, to help people and get, uh, I do readings for health and partners and sometimes cheating husbands and, <laughs> and all kinds of crazy, all kinds of crazy situations. Um, but also to help people also who have lost loved ones that they're not dead, they're fine, they're around you, don't worry. And, but for and, many years, you've never shared your story publicly. Yeah, and well, that, was the, that was the thing. That's right. And um, so I kept it quiet until one day I was on um, YouTube just watching um, some of the, the programs. And then I came across Jeff Mara, which I don't even watch him. Sorry to say, <laughs> I don't even watch him normally. And I saw a woman on there and she was telling a story. And, um, and so I said, oh, she's kind of cute. I, I, I want to see this. <laughs> so, so I turned on, I, I put on, on Jeff Mara and it was Jeff Morrow with Lori. <laughs> and Lori, you were telling your story about your, you, what you did on your, on your trips um, and, and what, you, what you saw. And, and, and I said, that's funny. That's a lot of how I felt and how I, how I saw things. And, and she's right. That's right. What you, and I said, I think I want to go tell my story with this person because this woman is inspiring me. Your story was so inspired that I wrote Jeff Morrow and I said, Jeff, that's a great, 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 great interview. I said, uh, she has some of the same ideas and feelings that I had when I, when I had passed. I said, I, 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 I want to tell you that's a great story. And I said, and, and then I, I wrote him and I said, thank you so much for sharing that. This, this woman really inspired me. Um, and then he wrote me back and said, would you like to be on my show and tell your story? And that was it. That was the key. And it was because of you. When I saw, heard and saw your story, it inspired me so much uh, to come out and tell my story. And that's, and, that, and that's the synchronicity. I just happened to be looking on YouTube and there you were. And I had seen other NDE stories from other places, but not Jeff Morrow, but other places. And they didn't inspire me. But when I saw yours, because what you were saying, I said, I can relate to that. That's exactly right. Exactly what she's saying. I can relate to what she's saying. 
it, that inspired me enough that I had to write Jeff and tell him about your in your your interview. And I said, that's such a great interview. And she's so right on target about what I felt, exactly what I felt would happen to me. And it's because of you that now, uh, I mean, I've done so many interviews now because of you and uh, over 4,000 emails all the time. And I always say to you, thank you, Lori. But that's <laughs> well, synchronicity. Blessing, that's you think synchronicity. the blessing is for me and you're thanking me, but the gift was actually to me because the other part of that story, of course, that nobody in our audience knows is that I was a regular watcher of Jeff Mara. I felt like I needed to share my story and I too reached out to him to share a story I had never shared publicly about my oh, nine yeah, yeah. out That's of body right. experience. Uh, yeah. So I reach out to Jeff and I go on his show and it was about, I don't know, maybe three weeks later. So about five months ago, um, I watch the interview with you. And while I'm listening to your interview, I hear you say things like, I was really, wasn't sure if I should share this. I've been really reluctant to share it. And I just felt inspired. I feel like the world needs to hear these, these truths. And I was like, yeah, that's me. That's me too. And so that night I kept thinking about your interview. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I decided to write an email to you. I'd never written an email to anybody else who had been interviewed on Jeff's show. And I'm like, all right. I just felt so compelled that I wrote this email and I put in the subject um, from one Jeff Mara interviewee to another. And I wrote you this heartfelt email about, thank you for sharing your story. It's amazing. And even though you were giving readings, I didn't ask for one. I didn't reach no, out to you. That's right. That. Yeah. It was just to congratulate you because I thought your story was amazing. And by the way, I'm going to have a link here that you guys can check out. Dennis's interview on Jeff's show. Um, Jeff Mara has interviewed like 300 people who have had near-death experiences. And Dennis, I don't even know if you know this, but your interview is in the top like 10 or 15 all time most popular interviews that Jeff has done. Oh, wow. <laughs> which is incredible. So, anyway, I send you this email. Now, I know at the time from listening to your interview, I'm in the central US time zone. You are in Switzerland. And I send this email out. And then I walk around for the next few hours going, Why did I send that? Like, why did I send that? I would, like, he's never going to answer me back. He's never going to, he's never going to answer me. And I woke up the next morning and I had an email in my inbox. Will you share what you wrote? Just paraphrase what you wrote. Yeah. Me. Well, I wrote to you. I said, I said, wow. I said, you don't know it, but I said, you are the actual person that inspired me to do the interview in the first place. And I said, we didn't even know that about each other, but you wrote me anyway, that's synchronicity. You wrote me anyway, you took the chance and you wrote me anyway to say just what you felt that you felt you, you enjoyed the interview, but just to show you, but you were the very person, if it hadn't been for your interview, I wouldn't have, nobody wouldn't have heard my interview. It was so funny because I didn't and, know why I felt so compelled to reach And that's out. why, yeah. and that's synchronicity. That's exactly it, that's why. And you don't know, always know you have that feeling, but you got to follow it. And that's what I tell people, follow it because that's the synchronicity. That's showing you that feeling, go with it, flow with it. So yeah. when I'm writing you, I think I am blessing you by telling you how your interview touched me. <laughs> that's but so the funny. real blessing yeah, well, was exactly. that it was you, you told me exactly. that I was the reason you won. I was, my mind was blown. I cried. When I yes. read your email, I walked around in a daze for probably 24 hours just going, I can't believe this. I can't believe the universe. I can't. I'm trying to tell you, work. if you go, if you talk to Jeff now, he's going to tell you, yeah, he wrote me about you first. And that's, and that's why, how I was able to even get him on my show because he wrote about your interview. That's right. Exactly. And I had seen so a lot funny. of interviews. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Funny. So the other, I think the other irony in this was by the time I had written you, you had received about 600 emails as a result of the show. I don't even know in getting that large a volume of emails, how you would have even seen 
my response. That well, the, even is mind blowing to me. Well, it, it's for me somehow. When I was get reading my emails, I just I just saw this one, and I just said, "Oh, let me write one at least one of these people back." And but but also, um, yeah, because of the name Lori, and I said that's a good name because I remember that's the interview person. <laughs> I mean, that's the the first name. I didn't know your last name. Could have been any right, Lori. Right, right. So I said that's a good name. I, I, that's sound like the person that that you know, and 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 it turned it out to be you. And then it's just so many synchronicities that you know that this is the universe saying, hey, <laughs> you guys are connected. This is going to help you. She's going to help you. You're going to help her. It's going to help. That's synchronicity. And that's Thank listening you. to your inner self and letting letting that go and not always listening to this, this logical mind that we call it. It helps us in other things, but it doesn't help us in everything. You got to listen to the heart inside. That's heart. Yeah. Yeah, it's so funny. So after that happened, we had some correspondences, of course, back and forth, and we decided to have a Zoom call. And I have to say, the moment we connected, like energy to energy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I knew immediately we had a soul connection. I feel like we've known each other probably through multiple lifetimes. Perhaps, There's yes. There's no way that we were not somehow connected before this. And I think we both felt that on that on that Yes, call, yes. Call. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure, <laughs> so for sure. Your life has changed a lot just since you shared that interview. So why don't you share with everybody what happened to the trajectory of your life? Because you're a professional musician. Your music is your life. This is what you do. But your life has definitely taken a little turn since your interview with Jeff. So I'd love for you to share that story. Well, the thing was, is that um, how it's changed uh, now <laughs> is that I have an overwhelming uh, amount of people that write me for readings now. Um, and, and I have to also manage my time a lot different than I did as an artist. And also for playing for music and stuff like that and shows, I, I have a different approach to it now than just um look at me how cool I am how I can sing nice and this and that I, I have more of are you feeling good are you enjoying it are you having a, a good feeling from my music do you feel love this is more of my approach now to my music than like before I was hey look how cool I am I have a nice shirt on look at my how, how well I can hold this note and well, well you're making it sound like you were like you were just a little bit into music why don't you share with the audience who you have been as a musician? Well, I mean, I, I've worked with Quincy Jones. I've worked with uh, <laughs> Chaka Khan. I, I mean, I, I, so many major, major artists, um, you know, uh, Santana, uh, George Benson, B.B. Um, King, um, so many uh, stylistics. Um, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, actually, the Stylistics was my first group that I went on tour with. Well, I was 18, you 19. Everything. 19. everything is you. That's you right. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And uh, that's my first group. See, that's another synchronicity. You know, the one that you like the most is the very first one. You see? And the first time I did my ND, NDE interview is because of you. The very first one. You see that synchronicity already? I'm just telling you, it just I happens it. and happens. And we didn't plan nothing. It just happened. It just so, happened. And it's amazing because it's not like it happened and you live in Arizona where I live. All this happened with you across the world in Switzerland, me here in the United States, and somehow we still connected. And that's another mm -hmm another way to understand that these soul connections are just energy connections they happen through space and time yeah, yeah, that's and it right. doesn't matter where you live or where you where you reside you exactly still can connect because it's just energy there you go that's right yeah that's right <laughs> so your life is full of synchronicities the way that mine is. I think our story is one of my favorite synchronistic stories, mm -hmm. but can you share a couple of stories of um, synchronicities that you've had since your life changed and, and you went in this direction besides the the, the bartender that you touched and- Well, I mean, I, I've, I've had, um, I mean, I've I just got an email from a, a, a client that um, she had a reading and she wanted to know 
um, would she have a baby? Because uh, she's been trying and, and, and will she ever have a family and stuff like that? And should she just give up on it? And uh, I told her that um, first thing she has to, she has to change worrying about it. Don't worry about it so much. Don't put some pressure, pressure on it about it and um, get happy, be happy, be as happy as you can, be on a high vibration and then try to make the baby. And I said, it will happen. I said, I asked your energy and it's going to happen. But you have to be on a more positive vibration because you're a little bit stressed about your your mother-in-law. Your mother wants you to have a child and, and you, you're stressed around that idea because it didn't happen and that you're, you're not good enough or your body's not going to be good enough. I said, you have to forget all that. Just be happy. Be laughing and be happy and then try to make the baby and it will happen. And guess what? <laughs> She's pregnant. And, mm. and she couldn't get pregnant before. Wow. So she's pregnant. She wrote me the letter and, and How I did said, you feel but, when you read that? I was really floored. I was so happy for her, <laughs> but I told her, I said, you know, it, it's not really me. It's just me reading your energy, your energy, you it's inside of you has all the answers. I don't have none of the answers. I said, I'm just able to read it. That was my gift. I'm able to read it, but, but, but you have all the answers inside of you. Yeah, well, we talk about vibration a lot. Vibration is something I've talked about a lot. I'm actually going to link a video if people want to really understand a little bit more deeply about the vibration. But I'm going to ask you specifically, Dennis, what mm -hmm. do you do? Because we talk about having a high vibration, having a low vibration. Um, not that there's a good or bad in that. There's no judgment or good or bad mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. just that we are energy and we vibrate. So what do you do to raise your vibration? And why do you think having a high vibration is helpful? Okay. Um, first thing I want to get clear. One of my downloads is there's no karma. <laughs> and I know people I, I agree trip with that. about there is no karma. It is law of attraction. What it is, is that if you're doing bad things, you put yourself on a frequency of bad things. And that's the, the possibility that could happen to you. But it's not because God is, oh, you did that and I'm going to do that. Or you did that in the last lifetime. No, I'm going to do that to you. No, it's not like that. It's um, you put yourself on a frequency, a lower frequency, then you open the door to lower frequency things to happen. Lower frequency okay. things are like no anger, um, hatred, lies, deception, uh, no love, uh, accidents. These are all lower frequencies, okay? And um, higher frequencies is love, appreciation, hope, um, joy, uh, gratitude. All these are, are high frequency. Uh, and this opens to what? More love, more abundance. Abundance is a high frequency. So, uh, so we shouldn't hate the rich people either because they also have abundance, um, but it depends on how they deal with that abundance, but, but it's there and it's, it's also part of a higher frequency. So the thing is, is that um, for me, what I do, because we are living in the change, what I call the change, and there's a lot of ups and downs. There's um, also physical things, which uh, I can get into that too, but um what I do, there's a bunch of things I do. Okay. I, I watch a funny movie. <laughs> I, I call a funny friend. I eat a piece of dark chocolate because that makes me laugh. <laughs> I go into the nature. I take a walk in the nature and watch the butterflies and the birds. I do a ride on my bicycle and feel the wind and, and watch the sun in the sky. Um, I write music. Sometimes just writing music uh, relieves me or I listen to good music that makes me smile and feel happy inside. Um, uh, I like uh, animals, uh, puppies or kittens or something cute and or rabbits, small rabbits, uh, baby rabbits. Um, anything that will bring you joy, a, a good memory. Sometimes I watch a, a, a photo of a, of a good memory I had with my mother or, or a photo that I had with my dad because me and my dad weren't so close when he when we were when I was a kid, but there was one photo that we took together that we both were happy, and I watched that photo. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that. Um, I have all kinds of tricks that I tell people to do 
do that you can be happier and happier that whatever that's going to make you more happy and put you on a higher vibration and this opens the door uh to opportunity abundance uh good health because laughing is what good for your body good for your health any doctor will tell you yeah so these are all all these goodies but 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 there's sometimes life is not hard i mean life is not easy and um, so you have to know if you feel your your vibration going down or some situation is pulling you down, then take the time to go do one of those things that make you happy. And and it's different for everybody. Some yeah. people it, it might be just sitting on a couch relaxing, you know. Right. And um, other people it might be um, you know going to a to a funny movie. Sorry, well, going to a funny movie. Yeah. And um, so you know, whatever makes you happy and fun, feel fun and feel good inside, do it. Take the time out to do it. And that way you can ensure your vibration is most of the time high. I love and that, it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's so important. That's such an important message because we do, we are in control of 60% of our happiness. A lot of it has to do with, to your point earlier, when you talked about somebody being rude to you or not very nice, just understanding, okay, they're not in the right place, but I don't have to reciprocate that. I can mm -hmm. actually send them love. So can you leave us with one final message that helps people to understand the bigger picture? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. You're a good interviewer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, you're easy to interview, I have to say. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, well, the thing is, you've got to really, really, really listen to is your heart. Um, that's so important. Not so much your mind, but what your heart is telling you. Not so much what your friends or what your your in-laws or who or your partner or whatever, what your heart is telling you. Because the heart is from the soul and from the spirit and it's from a lighter, more higher vibration. And if you listen to your heart, you can't go wrong. And if you trust your heart, you can't go wrong. I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> Dennis, thank you so, so much for being here. You are a blessing in so many ways. You're a blessing to me personally. I'm just so thankful that we are in each other's lives. And well, I'm, I'm thankful, thankful for you. you. I'm thankful, thankful for from for you and and knowing someone great like you, and also watching you explode in success <laughs> with your your new show. And also, I'm grateful to you. Like I said, because there would be I would have no uh, none of all these clients. If it, if it wasn't for me watching you, if if you hadn't That's had the courage, why. if you hadn't had the courage, it would be no me. So so I am totally grateful for you. And your story was super special. And and um, it moved me more. I've had seen maybe 20 or 30 NDE stories on the YouTube and they didn't move me until I saw you because I could feel the honesty and what you were saying. And it was hit me so hard that I said, oh, I got to write Jeff. I got to write Jeff about this, this person. And I never even wrote Jeff before. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, I got to write Jeff about this person, the, this, this interview. This is, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is me. This is, that's it. That's it. And so I say thank you to you. And always, if you need anything from me, I am here for you. <laughs> no, I love you, Dennis. I love I you. I love you too. I love you too. And I and I love that picture behind you. That's great. That is so great. It, it just looked like you, you're talking from the from it's the my, other side. <laughs> here. I'll actually open it up so everybody can see what this is. I yeah. don't always show it. Oh wow, it's wow. My, it's, oh, it's my beautiful. portal. Oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's my beautiful. portal to the other side. And when you I see love another, that. I've got this Buddha painting. Uh -huh. It's on the other wall. And when you look in that mirror, it actually uh -huh. looks at the eye of the Buddha. And I just oh, feel like it's great. It's, it's great. Mansion. Yeah, you've got a great, great, great eye for, for, for decorating, spiritual decorating. Great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you again for joining me. I wish you just so much success with everything you do and keep on keep on healing everybody you know the world as we go into this new phase as you say 
the world needs as much healing as it can get. Yes, and and much love. So it's, and much and love, love love is the key. If I want to say something, the last something, love is the key to all. That's love so. is the language of the universe. I think you're both in complete agreement with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And um, I wish you blessings and light and love 